today's 10th year anniversary event with regard to the subject of the end of times inshallah ta'ala the theme will revolve around the book but also the impending wars and famines and economic downslides that we are facing what they mean for us with regard to the cover firstly this cover is a representation of Bilad al-Sham as you can see Bilad al-Sham is central point of Al-Malhamat al-Kubra the major battle that will occur in the end of times in Akhir al-Zaman and here you have some boats those boats represent the boats of Tamim al-Dari radiallahu an going from the Bilad al-Sham from Syro Palestine or Greater Syria and then going out into the Mediterranean Sea when he went to inform the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam with regard to that historical event and his meeting with the Dajjal in person. Additionally, you will see rivers drying up, which is representative of the Euphrates River drying. There is also the Sea of Galilee, al Tabriya, which is known uh, the Lake of Tiberias. The, the lake drying up is one of the Ashratu Sa'a. But like all the covers in my books, there are many other subliminal messages within the cover. Of course, some of you may have picked up the compass, but also it can be read as the eye of a Dajjal. And similarly, the entire map of Asham, Bilad al-Sham, can be interpreted as not Bilad al-Sham, but the island of a Dajjal. There are two ways of interpreting the same cover. The boats of Tamim al-Dari could be drifting towards the island or they could be drifting away from Bilad al-Sham. It's a matter of interpretation. And then when we open the book, we have a dedication, if you remember, Islam answers atheism, the dedication was to every Don Quixote, and there was a reason for that. Here the dedication is for every Barzanji in the world. So many people ask, they said, why did you devote the book to Barzanji? Who is Al-Barzanji? Al-Barzanji is a reference to Al-Imam Muhammad bin Abdir Rasul, Al-Barzanji rahimallahu ta'ala, who lived in the 11th and 12th century, Islamic centuries, who wrote one of the hallmark works of Ashratu Sa'a, the signs of the end of times. The book is known as Al-Isha'a li Ashrati Sa'a. So the book, the dedication is given to Al-Imam Muhammad bin Abdir Rasul Al-Barzanji rahimallahu ta'ala. Now, we will go through some of that which was discussed in previous events but utilizing the compass of the book and when we take our telescope mental telescope the the eye of the mind and we reflect over the past events and how we viewed those events 10 years ago and how we view those events today we will be given some prescient ability to look into the future and how events may unfold in the near future. So, firstly, within the book, I mention the tradition of Sayyiduna Jibreel alayhi salam, the famous hadith of Jibreel alayhi salam when he came and questioned Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi wa sallam with regard to Al-Islam, Al-Iman, and regarding Ashratu Sa'a. But before Ashratu Sa'a, uh, regarding Al-Ihsan, and then regarding Yawm Al-Qiyamah, and then from Yawm Al-Qiyamah, the discussion went on to Ashratu Sa'a, the signs of the end of times. We know, of course, that Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam informed Jibreel alayhi salam 
with regard to an tara al-hufat al-urat al-ri'a al-sha'i yatatawalun fi al-bunyan and wa an talid al-amatu rabbataha famous signs both of these entail one of them entails the change of the material world around us leadership that leadership shall be in the hands of the bedouins that shall compete with one another in constructing towering buildings and then also the mental change amongst people how people will change their mentalities that is described as antali dal ammatu rabbataha one of the interpretations of this also is the effect of secular education amongst the people meaning the effect of having a secular education affects the mindset and today we observe the world that we have a huge proportion of the world's population having a materialistic mindset where the, where the goals of a, an individual are materialistic goals the goals are not the akhirul zaman uh, is not uh, the hayatul akhirah the world of the hereafter the goals are the worldly life and when the goals of a person the aims and objectives of an individual change from the akhirah to the dunya this is translated into our worldly life being a failure also because the companions alayhim ridwan when you study their biographies you will know that they loved death more than they loved life and allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gave them long lives when they fought jihad in the way of allah subhanahu wa ta'ala like sayyiduna khalid bin al-walid radiyallahu an who fought so many battles yet he died in his bed he lived long this was a secret of allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that those who love the akhirah more sometimes are given longer lives so the hadith of jibril alayhi salam it also entails the shifting mindset of society the mindsets have moved meaning amongst the muslims from a spiritual mindset to a materialistic mindset but this result in the muslims becoming failures materialistically so when they had a spiritual mindset allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gave a downpouring of material wealth amongst the muslims but when their mindset becomes materialistic they fail in their materialistic endeavors and they also fail in their spiritual endeavors so some of this is covered in terms of how that the hadith mentions the bedouins shall compete with one another in constructing tall buildings recently we saw that the saudi royal family is intending to construct a taller building than the building in the uae but at the same time the uae the building within the uae is such that they do not even have a sewage system so this goes hand in hand with the fact that they are failures some people they deem uae to be an advanced country in reality they are not advanced they are paying western corporations to build the infrastructure they would be advanced if they were constructing the infrastructure and designing it for themselves but they are paying others to do so so outwardly ostensibly they may seem as a nation that is forward thinking and advanced technologically but in reality they are as backward as people in the medieval times because you have human slavery human trafficking occurring within the UAE uh, to a large extent humans are trafficked from Africa and India from the Indian subcontinent and to uh, work as slaves in the U- the UAE so the bedouins and their ascendancy to power entails the turning the shift of of how of leadership how the leadership changes and additionally the mindset of the people is the sl- slave mindset which changes and shifts from the education that they receive so the type of education that they may receive affects their mindset affects how they view the world and this is reflected in antali dal amatu rabbataha that the slave girl shall give birth to her master or her mistress so what i mention 
within this discussion also is the pivotal role of Surah Al-Kahf. Surah Al-Kahf has a tremendous role in our daily lives, especially in, in Akhir Zaman. We know from the hadith of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa alihi wa sallam, anyone who recites Surah Al-Kahf every Friday, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala creates for them a nur, a light, which accompanies them from Friday to Friday. This enlightens and illuminates the heart and the mind by which a person is able to make a distinction between al-haqq wal batil truth and falsehood. And Surah Al-Kahf, we will find that Surah Al-Kahf is within the middle of the Qur'an, like a cave. Like the cave is a place of refuge, a person goes into a cave. Similarly, the middle of the Qur'an is a point of refuge. A person finds refuge in the Qur'an. So Surah Al-Kahf, even if a person cannot recite the entire chapter of Surah Al-Kahf, the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam gave a rukhsa, a leeway that we can recite the first 10 verses of Surah Al-Kahf every Friday. So this is for the believer in Akhir zaman in the time we live in, that we must recite Surah Al-Kahf every Friday. Every Friday entails from Salatul Maghrib on Thursday evening all the way to Salatul Maghrib on Friday evening. Any time in between that time, a person recites Surah Al-Kahf or the first 10 verses of Surah Al-Kahf or the last 10 verses of Surah Al-Kahf, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will not only give them a light by which they can make a distinction between truth and falsehood, they will also be protected from a dajjal if he appears. But note also, they are not only protected from a dajjal the individual, they are protected from the fitna to dajjal. Why do I mention fitna to dajjal? Because in one hadith narrated by Imam Ahmad in his Musnad, Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa alihi wa sallam very clearly mentioned that any tribulation, fitna, that occurs prior to the appearance of a dajjal the individual, is a tribulation that prepares the way for a dajjal. Therefore, the term fitna to dajjal or dajjalic times would entail the tribulations or the environment of a person which is filled with various types of tribulations. So by recitation of Surah Al-Kahf, we protect ourselves also from those tribulations. So the tribulations that we face now, tribulations are not limited. They are mutanawi'. What is mutanawi'? Types. You have tribulation with wealth. You have tribulation with family. You have tribulation with women. You have tribulation with economy. You have tribulation in military warfare. You have tribulation with governments. You have tribulation of warring factions. Various types of tribulations by recitation of Surah Al-Kahf, we protect ourselves. So Surah Al-Kahf has a pivotal role for the believer in Akhir zaman Like any chapter of the Quran, we know for instance Surah Tabarak al protects a person from Adab al-Qabr. And Al-Imam Abdullah bin As'ad al-Yafi'i rahimullah, he mentions that Surah Tabarak also protects a person throughout the day. Even reciting in one hadith, it states that a person reciting Ayatul Kursi and Hameen after Ayatul Kursi protects the person for the entire day. So like this, various chapters of the Quran, they have a particular effect created by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in our lives. Surah Al-Kahf is the chapter of Akhir zaman that you will find that the themes of Surah Al-Kahf are such that all the themes are interlinked. For instance, the sleepers, they went into the cave, they slept for 300 years. Firstly, the years were disputed and only Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala could reveal the exact number of years. <laughs> Tis'a. 
that they remained in their cave for how many years? For 300 years was Dadu Tis'a and they added nine meaning 309 years. Additionally, the people, they disputed the number of people who slept in the cave. Some of them said five and then their dog is the sixth. Some of them said six and the seventh is the dog. Some of them said uh, seven and the eighth was the dog. And this was the correct number. But the number could only be revealed by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Then we read the theme of Surah Al-Kahf. You find the story of the two people, of the, uh, the two men in the garden. One of them was obsessed with his material life to the point he disputed with the believer regarding the Akhirah. Why? Because his obsession with the material wealth. Why is this theme in Surah Al-Kahf? Because the believer in the end of times is being warned with regard to a Dajjal's material world. A Dajjal is materialistic in his nature. How? Even the people who believe in a Dajjal, they will believe in him due to his materialistic miracles in the sense that those so-called miracles, in reality, it's referred to as istidraj on the hands of, a, of an unbeliever. That he brings about material gain for the Bedouins in times of droughts. He gives them material gain. But he is also a material god, meaning they believe in him, but he is what? A material god. He has dimensions and form and he is a man and he has two eyes and one eye is what? Deformed. So the people who will worship at the Jal are materialistic people in nature. So the, the theme of Surah Al-Kahf informs us with regard to the materialistic nature of the disbeliever, the unbeliever. Additionally, the chapter has the story of whom? Of Sayyiduna Musa alayhi salam and Sayyiduna Khidr alayhi salam. The theme of which is what? The questioning that Musa alayhi salam questions with regard to the ghayb, the unseen. And he must not question the unseen until he is given knowledge of the unseen. Also the identity of the king Dhul Qarnayn who ruled the east and the west, the specific name of the king is not revealed because the later person, the later king or ruler who reads the Quran, he cannot claim that these traits of the king are specific to that king. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala left the specific identity so no one can say that, ident that person was specific to justice. No, every king who comes after must carry out justice. So, the identity of Dhul Qarnayn salam is also left out. Why? Because the theme of Surah Al-Kahf is what? Is that the ghayb is only known to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and the believer must wait until Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala himself reveals the unseen. This is why it's futile for someone to attempt to identify Al-Imam Al-Mahdi today. It's futile for someone to identify the location of a Dajjal's island today. It's futile for someone to attempt to identify the barrier of Ya'juj and Ma'juj today. It's futile unless it's done in a theoretical academic research manner, but with certainty you can never determine these things because they are ultimately ghayb and they will only be revealed once they occur. So the rule, the golden rule within the book is that the ashratu sa'a, the signs of the end of times become clear as they unfold. As certain things may seem ambiguous, those things no longer remain ambiguous when the signs unfold. So for instance, the hadith that mentions that the shoelace of a person will inform him of what his family does while he was away or the the walking stick, the cane, will inform him of what his family does while he was away. All of these things may have been ambiguous in the time when they were stated. And in subsequent centuries when the hadith was recited, but the meaning became clear as time unfolded their reality. And we had the modern invention of various gadgets and devices which uncovered the reality of the meaning of those hadith. Similarly, when certain events have not unfolded and have not transpired, 
it is futile for so-called self-professed uh, uh, eschatologists to claim to know the exact interpretation of those things. And this is why Surah Al-Kahf is an essential chapter to study because the theme of Surah Al-Kahf is the ghaib. Is that there are certain things of the unseen you will never know until Allah reveals. People did not know the location of the seven sleepers until Allah revealed their location. People did not know the number of years they slept in the cave until Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala revealed the number of years. People did not even know the number. They disputed the number until Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala revealed the number of sleepers. So this brings us to another aspect, which is Islamic literature and eschatology. What is eschatology? Eschatology is the subject that discusses, for instance, dream interpretation, uh, Yawm Al-Qiyamah, the Day of Judgment, so many various things. But the specific subject under discussion is Ashratu Sa'a, the signs at the, em the end of times. The literature and eschatology from the early period was compiled by the scholars of hadith but not in any uniform fashion and without commentary. So you had classical books like Nu'aym bin Hamad's book Al-Fitan. He had a book called Al-Fitan. He is one of the shuyukh of Imam Muhammad bin Ismail al-Bukhari rahimahullah ta'ala. And he had a book Al-Fitan which that book by the way is available in English also but without commentary. And there were many other books written, Uthman bin Sa'id al-Dani's book, and Ashratu Sa'a, likewise, so many other works. Some of the ulama attempted to organize the hadith on the end of times into an organized, uh, a organized fashion, meaning according to subject matter and uh, in uh, uh, synchronicity, giving synchronicity to the order of events like Al-Imam Al-Qurtubi rahimahullah ta'ala in his book Al-Tadhkirah. Later on, Al-Imam Muhammad bin Abdi Rasul Al-Barzanji rahimahullah, he wrote the best book on the subject, which I mentioned he was 11th and 12th century scholar. So the subject matter was given an order of events, and this is why it's important to mention disastrous misunderstandings. What are disastrous misunderstandings? Disastrous misunderstandings are when people take the ahadith relating to the end of times out of context. When they misuse the hadith, when they attempt to interpret every event that is occurring today geopolitically in light of the hadith and they will be mistaken. In many cases, grossly. And these are known as disastrous uh, misunderstandings. So I give a few examples. One example is the case of Juhayman al utaybi who hijacked Al-Masjid al-Haram with 300 cohorts, young men he had brainwashed, convincing them that his brother-in-law Muhammad al-Qahtani is the actual Mahdi. This was in 1979, coinciding with the Islamic century of 1400 Hijri. How was he able to do this? He isolated 300 followers to an area in the desert and brainwashed them over time. How was he able to brainwash them? This brings us to what is known as false miracles and false dreams. They claimed that the dreams were a clear sign that Muhammad al-Qahtani is in fact the Mahdi, dreams. So dreams are a common theme that are found amongst these groups. As I will list some of the groups, you will realize that they commonly utilize dreams in order to validate their misinterpretation of the hadith. The rule here is that Quran, Sunnah and Ijma'ah. We as Ahl Sunnah wal Jama'ah, as Imam Abu Ja'far al-Tahawi rahimahullah ta'ala points out in his aqeedah, his belief, is that we follow Qur'an, Sunnah from the Ahadith of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, and then Ijma' of the companions, Ijma' of Sahaba, 
an ijma' of the later and successive generations on any given matter. When there is ijma', we follow the ijma'. We do not follow isolated individuals irrelevant to what dreams they may claim. So dreams, if they are pr a proof, they will only be a proof if they conform to the Quran, Sunnah and Ijma'. Similarly, Kash, spiritual unveilings. Spiritual unveilings are what? That a person may see some of the world of similitude. Alam al-Mithal in a wakeful state. How do you tell the difference between a madman and a person who has this actual Kash? Madmen will even see their visions when they close their eyes, but people who have Kash, their visions are real and they conform to the Quran and Sunnah and Ijma' and they do not contravene the Quran, Sunnah and Ijma'. So the famous case of Juhayman al utaybi I give citation to this, but also the methods of mind control. Mind control may involve a narcissistic leader who then manipulates his followers into certain practices. Sometimes those practices may involve manipulation as well as sleep deprivation, as well as even starving some of their followers from even protein. And they give disastrous guidelines to their followers. For instance, now we live on a knife's edge in the world today with Ukraine and Russia. And this is nothing new for the world because anyone who reads on the Cold War between the USSR and the former USSR, now known as Russia, and the USA, you will find that history repeats itself. You only need to read upon the Cuban Missile Crisis and how close Kennedy was in going to war. And even prior to Kennedy in the 1950s, there were Ameri an American general even advised one of the presidents to, to fire nuclear weapons over 30 nuclear warheads. And the, the president then fired him from his post. Meaning the world has always, in every age, been on a knife's edge. Now, if people, cult leaders realize this, so they give out predictions, placing their followers on the edge, meaning advise them sometimes to sell up their homes, buy farmland for the cult leader, buy gold, and then what happens, World War Three may not even occur, and the person has ruined his life. So many of them, they drop out of education, they drop out of madrasa, even studying the deen. Some of them stopped studying the deen, some of them stopped studying dunya, some of them stopped their jobs and supporting their families because they believe the world is ending, and then eventually the world does not end. It contradicts the guidelines of Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam who advised people that even if you are planting a tree, then plant the tree. You continue doing your job. So the case of uh, Juhayman al utaybi is not isolated. There was the case of Abdullah al-Hashim. Who is Abdullah al-Hashim? Many of you will remember many years ago, there was a YouTube series known as The Arrivals. This series was taking excerpts from movies and musical videos and placing them in a, a choreography, meaning a organized fashion with a narrative on the end of times. And they would utilize graphics. And then people became fixated upon this series. And what the series did, it led them through a, a theme of Akhir zaman Some things were true, some many were false. But it led them to the end, which was that the battle between the line of Fir'aun shall continue and the Ahlul Bayt in the form of Al Imam al Mahdi radiallahu an, and the actual makers of the series were Shia. Now they were inspired by a, a, a man named Abdullah al-Hashim who was from America and this Abdullah al-Hashim he made a series also that the, the name of the series was that the Dajjal will be a reptilian shapeshifter 
And this series was big on YouTube, but it got taken down by YouTube because of copyright infringes. They, uh, copyright infringement, but they claimed that it was taken down due to conspiratorial reasons, that the, supposedly these documentaries open the mind of people, that there may be a mass revolution. This is how they pitch themselves to the public. Now the danger of Abdullah al-Hashim was that he gradually developed a following, he, he had a following, online following, and then he brought them into Shiaism. But then from Shiaism, meaning becoming Rawafid, he led them into a particular cult, the cult of a man known as Ahmad al-Hassan. Ahmad al-Hassan is a Shi'i Rafidi from Basra in Iraq, who claims to be one of the many sons of Imam al-Mahdi. And then they have their own unique beliefs. So they are not even 12 Shia, because that is the, the natural growth of Shiaism. It goes from weird beliefs to even more weirder beliefs. That what happened? is that they believe Ahmad al-Hassan is the Mahdi and they have a following. So Abdullah al-Hashim brainwashed these young men. And then I give the whole historical account regarding Abdullah al-Hashim, how he gradually brainwashed young men into following his cult by claiming that the end of times are nigh and Ashratu Sa'a are occurring and therefore we need to join the cult of Ahmad al-Hassan. Then we analyze some of the history of Mirza Ghulam Ahmed Qadiani. Now, Mirza Ghulam Ahmed Qadiani and the history of Mirza Ghulam is given in the book. But just to say that many young people who converse with the Qadiani cult, they will realize that the Qadiani cult, whenever they converse, they attempt to bring up the issue of the return of Isa Ali Salam first. So many times they will attempt to prove to a person that Mirza Ghulam is Isa Ali Salam or the Messiah, is the Messiah and the Mahdi. And in order to exemplify this, what do they say? They say Isa Ali Salam died. He died. They need to prove that he died. But in reality, you can bypass this discussion with them. Why? Is it important for them to prove that Isa Ali Salam died? Say for argument's sake, even if we agreed that Sayyiduna Isa Ali Salam died and was raised up, which is the main thing is that he was raised up. They believe he is buried in Kashmir. But the main belief is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala raised him. Whether he died or not. But for argument's sake, if we agree with you, how does that prove in any way or form that Mirza of Punjab was a prophet? It does not prove that in any way or form. You should go in a discussion with them, you should go straight to that point. Say, how does it prove that this man from Punjab is a prophet? How can a man from Punjab even be a prophet? How can anyone be a prophet after Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam? Because the Quran is decisive in terms of Khatam al nabiyyin the finality of prophets. So this, of course, is what a divergence on their part whenever they bring up the, the re return of Isa alayhi salam. So some of the history of the Qadiani cult is mentioned in here, which is essential for people to read but there is a history of other cults also in previous times during the caliphate of Bani Abbas there was a man who became known as Al-Muqanna the veiled why was he veiled? they say firstly he led a revolution against some of the Banu, Banu Abbas but he was veiled because his form, his face had been disfigured. So he would veil himself. And he was based in Central Asia, East Asia, East of Iran, Central Asia, all that region. 
and he was in charge of many fortresses. He, he, he gathered a huge following. And then what he would do, he placed a reflecting metal inside of a well and positioned himself in such a way that when the sun rose, the light from the well would reflect off his face. And then he would remove the veil from his face and his followers actually believed he was illuminated and reflecting so much light. And he carried out other tricks, like he was able to concoct by magic, by devices, a false moon, a false moon over a lake to the people that he has carried out these miracles. Eventually he was killed, but he gathered a huge following. Additionally, there is the mention here of the Qaramita, the Qaramita sect. This was a sect that hijacked Al-Masjid Al-Haram in previous centuries also. Their history is mentioned, how they took the black stone, and when they took the black stone, the black stone remained in their captivity until one of the Khalifas had the black stone returned. This sect was known as the Qaramita. Also, there is the example of a man some of you may have heard of, Riyaz Gohar Shahi. This man was from Karachi and in his youth, he went out into the mountains, carrying out various spiritual practices without the guidance of a sheikh. And he had no knowledge of aqidah and fiqh. And when you have no knowledge of tawheed, and no knowledge of aqidah in general, and no knowledge of al-fiqh, sharia, and you attempt to carry out spiritual practices, you will be misguided. So this man, he claimed many spiritual unveilings and spiritual experiences. Then he came to Britain and the Western world for a tour of the various European countries. In fact, he even visited America. He came here to the UK. And what he claimed is that he was in fact the Mahdi. And then by, initially by way of implication, his followers would publish leaflets claiming that his face was found on the black stone. And there was a Saudi Wahhabi conspiracy to cover it up. And then his followers also claimed that his, his images were found on the moon. So this, of course, is an interesting feature for psychiatrists and psychologists to study, that a person can, with a blob of ink, a person can see into a blob of ink whatever he wants. So his followers were looking at the moon, they were seeing Gohar Shai. They were looking into the black stone, they were seeing Gohar Shai. And then he, he gathered a following, and then suddenly he died of pneumonia in London. Now at the time when he died, the Jung newspaper carried an article that his followers claimed that he's only dead for 40 days and he will be resurrected. But of course he was not resurrected and then they transported his body back to Pakistan. His followers split. The, one, the followers in Pakistan claimed he never had these misguided beliefs. Why? Because of the laws in Pakistan regarding khatm al finality of prophethood, they would face a trial and judgment at court if they claimed such things. But his followers remain today. They have the Gohar Shai Foundation today and they claim that they have spiritual practices. So they divest themselves of Sharia. They do not pray five times a day. They do not fast in the month of Ramadan. They do not carry out Hajj. They do not give Zakat. But they claim that they do spiritual dhikrullah. And then even the dhikrullah, they do not even do it with the tongue. They claim that they do dhikrullah with the heart. So this means that the nafs, that which they claim that they are at war with, has overpowered them. To the point that the nafs, which it is the ego that makes a person abandon salah. It is the ego that makes a person abandon the, the fasting in the month of Ramadan. That nafs that they claim that they are fighting has actually overpowered them. So this was the cult of whom? 
Riyaz Gohar Shai. And he also claimed to be Al Mahdi, so that's why the subject is related to the theme uh, of the book, uh, meaning the subject of Riyaz Gohar Shai. Additionally, there are non Muslim cults. So do not think that these cults only exist amongst Muslims. Every religious group will have cults that misinterpret their religious texts. Like you have in the Christian Bible Belt, you have Christian groups that misinterpret the New Testament. So Jonestown being a prime example. Jonestown, so many of you must have heard of the phrase drinking Kool-Aid. Why do they state drinking Kool-Aid? Because he had his followers drink Kool-Aid, which was laced with poison and they drank and they died. Over 500 of them in Guyana. How was he able to brainwash so many people? If you want to study all the world's religions, you study the world's religions in India. If you want to study all the world's sects, you study the sects in Pakistan. Pakistan has all the sects and all the cults. Every other year you find sects within Pakistan or cults where the person, the cult leader is able to brainwash people into doing things which a, a person with any sanity would not do. So many cult leaders they have in Pakistan, like they have this La Fani Sarkar, who's dead now, he died, Riyaz Gohar Shai. So many different cult leaders. Within the Hindu religion, you also find them in India. So many various cult leaders, as I mentioned some of them in the book. But likewise, in the USA, in America, you find these cults also. But also in the UK, you do have uh, demonic cults within the UK. Some of them I mentioned historically in the 1800s in Victorian England, there was a person who was a rival to Mirza Ghulam Ahmed Qadiani. So this first segment of the book, it deals with how people can be brainwashed into a cult, how they can be brainwashed through the subject of the end of times. Nowadays, it's more dangerous because you can be brainwashed online. You could be watching certain videos, like when ISIS recruited, they recruited many young men and young ladies from YouTube videos. So they claimed initially Abu Bakr al-Baghdadi was a Mahdi-like figure and he was gaining a following and eventually he will become the Khalifa. And then when he appeared, they claimed he was Ahlul Bayt. So this entails that not only do the Shia Rawafid exploit being Ahlul Bayt, not only the Sufi groups exploit being Ahlul Bayt, this is exploited today. Because every person will claim he's Ahlul Bayt, he's Sayyid, you must kiss his hand and then gain wealth from people and do various things which people will not question. It demonstrates that the Wahhabis and the Salafis also do this because they claim that with regard to Abu Bakr al-Baghdadi that he was from Ahlul Bayt. Initially they had a series of videos, the light reloaded, something like this. The series was named The Light Reloaded and it brainwashed young people into thinking that the end of times is coming, the Armageddon is coming and people must prepare. Now you still have, whether it's Shia, whether it's Sufis or whether it's Salafis, Wahhabis, they all have videos, very, all these various groups, that they have videos which brainwash young people into believing things which are incorrect, uh, meaning mixing conspiracy theories with the uh, hadith of the Ashratu Sa'a. So, some of the conspiracy theories we covered, if you remember the initial event in 2012 was the, the Mayan, Mayan calendar, that the calendar they claimed coincided with 2012 and the world will end in 2012. This did not occur. Or for instance, the Olympic Games. There was a conspiracy theory regarding the Olympic Games that the Olympic Games in Britain in 2012 
is a conspiracy, a national conspiracy where Britain, for some strange reason, will utilize nuclear weapons in London, meaning Britain will destroy itself. And there was a person at the time, Ian Crane, a conspiracy theorist who died now. He elaborated on all these various conspiracy theories of fracking, uh, fracking for oil in the ground that it causes various problems and this coincides with the 2012 Olympic Games and so many young Muslims were convinced by this they thought when the, uh, the, cons when the Olympic Games occur what will happen a nuclear weapon will land uh, on London and they read into these conspiracy theories there was another uh, young man whose name was Clay he wrote a blog in 2007 then he committed suicide later out of mental depression where he made all these predictions through reading into conspiracy theories. So what happens very commonly, like what happened with the Y2K bug in 1999, is that many people, they mix conspiracy theories with Islam. This does not only happen in Ashratu Sa'a, it happens in many other things. For instance, so many people now, they mix flat earth theory with geocentric model. When geocentric and heliocentric models are actual scientific models. But flat earth theory is a conspiracy theory. It does not fit with geocentric or heliocentric models. Or for instance, so many people, they will fall into geopolitical conspiracy theories, where they will believe that there is a geopolitical conspiracy where people are conspiring and they will not be able to analyze certain realities in society. Why is this? Because real life events are complicated. The world is complex. So people want an oversimplification. For instance, if you just look at religious sects alone, religious sects alone are, are more deeper than onion layers. If you cut an onion, layer after layer, the intricacies involved are so many and complex that you cannot make any sense of this. But similarly, when you look at geopolitical events, when you look at events transpiring around us, <coughs> it is easy to conclude that there is a conspiracy without analyzing history and the development of how we reached this point. For instance, just read British history. Read British history from the year zero and then the year one, meaning the year BC, and then the year one AD, what they refer to as AD. We say CE, from the Christian era, from one to 2022. Look at the complexities of the royal families, how many various kingdoms, how they shifted. Look at the history of Oliver Cromwell, look at how parliament fought the royals, and then within the royals, how the complexity, the economic complexities, the geopolitical complexities. And how this coincides with the complexities of the colonies of America and the coloniz colonization of India. You will realize when you read history from a broad pers perspective that there is no conspiracy. It's human events unfolding. And to be able to interpret what is unfolding in, uh, would demand patience and long study, meaning study of history, politics, economy, and people do not have time to do this. So they must refer to experts. But when conspiracy theorists realize that there is a vacuum of explanation for the common people, what do they do? They fill it in with conspiracy theories. So this concludes the first segment of the book. The second segment of the book is the timeline from the time of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa alihi wa sallam until our time and until the time of Imam al-Mahdi. So when we go through this time, for instance, you have the passing away of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. This was one of the major ashratu sa'a, one of the major signs of the end of times. 
that Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi wa sallam will pass away. And after he's passing away, the companions alayhi wa ridwan, they will have some conflict. And then the conflict will be resolved. And then the period of the Khulafa, al Khulafa al Rashidun, the rightly guided caliphs, especially the Khilafa of Sayyiduna Umar radiallahu ta'ala anhu and the conquering of Jerusalem. So I give history, detailed history, with regard to the conquering of Jerusalem and the plague that occurred in the time of Sayyiduna Umar radiallahu anhu, which is known as the Amwas plague, in which thousands of people died. This is a history which people need to familiarize themselves with. Additionally, there was the problem of false prophets appearing in the time of Sayyiduna Umar radiallahu an, like Musaylama al kazzab who garnered a huge following and they went to war against the Khalifa and was defeated by Sayyiduna Abu Bakr al-Siddiq radiallahu an with the armies dispatched under the leadership of Sayyiduna Khalid bin al-Walid radiallahu an. Then there is the famous conquering of Jerusalem, Al-Quds al-Sharif. When Sayyiduna Umar radiallahu an, he entered Al-Quds al-Sharif. He even met a Jewish man at the time. And the Jewish man, Sayyiduna Umar radiallahu an, asked the Jewish man regarding a Dajjal. Remember, Jews were not permitted to enter Jerusalem and by the Christians. The Christians had barred them from entering the city. He met the Jewish man at the gates of the city and he asked, as Ibn Lathir points out in Al Kamil fi Tariq, regarding a Dajjal, and the, the Jews said, you, you Arabs have nothing to fear regarding a Dajjal because he will be killed at your hands, meaning they knew this from their scriptures. So the conquering of Jerusalem was from the major Ashratu Sa'a and it relates also to the second conquering of Jerusalem and the restoration of the Khilafah in the Akhir zaman Then you have the, the martyrdom. Remember the plague of Amwas occurred after. The plague of Amwas occurred after the conquering of Jerusalem. Then you have the martyrdom of Sayyiduna Umar radiallahu ta'ala anhu that Sayyiduna Umar radiallahu an was martyred by a Persian man, a slave, an unbeliever, a fire worshipper, by the way whom the Rawafid Shia they venerate to this day. In Iran they have a shrine dedicated to this man, the Rawafid. Likewise the Rawafid, the Shia, they venerate Mukhtar al-Thaqafi, a false prophet. A false prophet they have a shrine dedicated to him in Iraq. Then you have the martyrdom of Sayyiduna Uthman radiallahu ta'ala anhu. Sayyiduna Uthman radiallahu anhu was martyred and this was foretold by the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wasallam. And the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wasallam gave guidelines who will be upon guidance. Meaning at the time Uthman radiallahu anhu will be on guidance. Then there is the detail relating to the battle of the camel, Al-Jamal. This is important to know because there are so many young Sunnis today who question the history, the historical account regarding the wars between the Sahaba alayhim ridwan and they become misguided. Remember, the Rawafid are the most deviant sect within those that are referred to as Muslims, because there's a dispute whether they are even Muslim. Some ulama dis declare them unbelievers. Other ulama say they are unbelievers if they, if they believe in three tenets of faith, for instance. But the Shia Rawafid and the subsects of the Shia Rawafid are something that Ahl Sunnah wal Jama'ah must oppose theologically. Historically, our ulama have opposed the Shia Rawafid, have never associated with them. And also theologically in terms of the literature that has been written, like Imam Ahmad bin Zaini Dahlan, rahimahullah, you look at the books he wrote against the Shia Rawafid. He was the mufti of the Shafi school. They are a danger. I'll give you an example. Recently I was reading a book 
written in the, in the 8th Islamic century regarding Nuruddin al-Shaheed, Nuruddin Zangi, rahimullah. When you reach the year 561, it mentions Nuruddin Zangi, rahimullah ta'ala, he carried out jihad in a certain place. And then the book mentions, in this year, the pious Imam, Sheikh Abdul Qadir al-Jilani, rahimullah, passed away in this year, 561 Hijri. But then the author also mentions, in this year, the Shia Rawafid caused tribulation in Baghdad. They would attack Sunnis, but they would also openly curse the companions, alayhi muridwan. They would attack a Sunni even if he wore kuhal. What is kuhal? Antimony on the eyes. If he wore kuhal on the 10th of Muharram, they would attack him. Because they believe any type of joyous celebration on the 10th of Muharram, which coincides, happens to coincide with the 10th of Muharram, they believe it's haram. So the fitna of the Rawafid, 900 years later, 900 years later, or nearly 900 years later, today the Muslim world is occupied by the Zionist entity in Jerusalem. We are occupied. We have two internal tribulations. One is the Rawafid that weaken the Muslims from within and the other is the Wahhabis. They weaken the Muslims from within. And I mentioned with regard to ISIS, and I have always said this, thousands of Salafi youth entered Syria for so-called jihad, yet those thousands of Salafi youth, they did not go in the direction of occupied Palestine. Thousands of them. They weakened Syria as a country. Syria was internally destroyed and is internally destroyed. Yet not a single grenade was thrown into occupied Palestine. And similarly, the Shia Rawafid, they raise their flag and enter Muslim countries and curse the companions alayhim ridwan. Like what is occurring now in Pakistan. Instead of discussing the emancipation of Kashmir and the restoration of Sharia in Pakistan, and fighting secularism in Pakistan. What are the Shia Rawafid doing in Pakistan today? They are weakening the Ahl Sunnah wal Jama'ah. So this fitna, this tribulation occurs every century. And it is also a part of Ashratu Sa'ad, the signs of the end of times. So the battle of the Jamal, it's essential for young Muslims to know the history of the companions. Likewise, the battle of Sifin and disputes amongst the companions and the battle of Nahrawan. The battle of Nahrawan was when Sayyiduna Ali radiallahu ta'ala anhu fought the Khawarij. He fought the Khawarij. And after fighting the Khawarij, the people praised Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and they said, this tribulation has ended. But Sayyiduna Ali radiallahu anhu said, it has not ended because it will continue from the loins of men in every generation, there will be a group of Khawarij. What is Khawarij? The Khawarij mentality is declaring Muslims as unbelievers and then killing them, destroying their property and murdering them. Then you have the martyrdom of Sayyiduna Ali radiallahu an. This was also from Ashratu Sa'a when Sayyiduna Ali radiallahu an would be martyred. And you have the peace of Al Imam al Hassan radiallahu an with Amir Muawiyah radiallahu an. This was from Ashratu Sa'a also. And this year became known as Amul Jama'a, the year of the congregation, the year of the unity. And then afterwards, you had the martyrdom of Al Imam al-Husayn radiallahu an, where he was martyred in the land of Karbala, which led to more extremism amongst the supporters of the Ahlul Bayt who claim to follow the Ahlul Bayt. And then you had the events of Al-Harra. What were the events of Al-Harra? When Yazid commanded his armies to enter al madinatul Munawwara and carry out acts of atrocity for three days. 
atrocities for three days where over 700 Sahaba were killed and thousands of women were raped. This event became known as the events of Al-Harra. Then you had the wars between Abdullah bin Az-Zubayr radiallahu an, Al-Hajjaj bin Yusuf and Mukhtar al-Thaqafi, the false prophet, this period of time. Afterwards, you had the caliphate of Sayyiduna Umar bin Abdul Aziz in the year 99 Hijri to the year 101. And then Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam prophesied the caliphate of Banu al-Abbas. And Banu al-Abbas, they ruled for an extended period of time. And then after Banu al-Abbas, you have the Mongol invasion of Baghdad. This was foretold by Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And the fire of the Hijaz in the seventh century, there was a huge fire that appeared out on the outskirts of Al-Munawwarah, which illuminated the, the necks of the camels in Busra in Syro-Palestine, which occurred in the seventh century. Then you had the Crusades and the period of Sultan Salahuddin al Ayyubi and the Ottomans, the Uthmani Caliphate, which extended formally up to the year 1924 in a formal fashion. Really, it ended in 1908 when a Sultan Abdul Hamid al Thani, rahimallah, he was forced to abdicate the Caliphate. What is mentioned here also is the Ghutha period. What is the Ghutha period? The Ghutha period is an extended period in which the Muslims are like froth on the sea. Why are we likened to froth on the sea? Because of our weakness. What is our main weakness? This is essential to understand. Our main weakness is weakness of Iman. It's not material weakness. Our main weakness is weakness of Iman. Meaning, if we fill the masajid for Salatul Fajr and we avoided sins en masse as a majority group, we would not be in the situation that we are in. The more we abandon our deen and we have weakness of faith, we are disgraced in the dunya also. So this period is known as the Ghutha period. Within the Ghutha period, you have the Industrial Revolution. So Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa foretold the period of time. There are specific hadith on this. That people of the countryside will move into the cities. So independence of the people who live in the countryside is done away with. And this occurred during the Industrial Revolution. This was foretold by Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and also the inception of mega cities, what we live in today, mega cities, huge cities, that the people are no longer self-sufficient. They are no longer self-sufficient. What do I mean? If today all the stores close down and we have our electric shut down, how will we survive, the majority of us? We are dependent on the system, on the power grid to survive. We are dependent on the government and corporations to make electric for us, to dispatch gas to our homes, to provide food in the stores. We are no longer self-sufficient. And this is the, one of the tidal shifts in how people live. Additionally, this Ghutha period has stages. You have the Ahlas stage. The Ahlas stage is the stage when the various nations of the world, they colonize the Muslim lands and exploit the Muslim lands, plunder the Muslim lands. But is the fault, the fault of the colonizers? The answer is the fault firstly lies in the hands of the Muslims. Why? Because when we are internally corrupt, we give a, possible, a possibility of colonization. How? Just study how India was colonized. How was Robert Clive able with 50,000 troops on the side of Siraj Dola 
and only a few thousand on the side of the British, how was he able to colonize in parts of India at that time? Because of internal corruption. Similarly today, if there was no weakness of Iman and internal corruption, the lands would never be colonized. Because the Muslims do have the material means of repelling the, the colonialists, except we have weakness of Iman. So this period, when the lands were colonized, is known as the Ahlas period. Why is it known as Ahlas period? Because it's likened to the saddle cloth. Then you have the second fitna, which is the Sarra stage. The Sarra, fitna to Sarra. This stage, I mention the ripples of the Arab Spring. The ripples of the Arab Spring, which in reality was an Arab winter. Now we look in hindsight and we see the results of what people thought was a, an actual revolution in Syria. Today, millions of young children are displaced in Syria, internally and externally, living in camps as refugees. Winter time now, they live in snow. But those who call for the revolution, they live in luxury. So we look in hindsight, we realize that that was indeed a fitna, a tribulation. And during this time, we had the pharaonic Zionist occupation of Palestine, which continues. So while Zionism from the late 1800s infests and occupies the Muslim lands, we have the Muslims with their weakness of Iman being colonized and have internal disruption, internal destruction of our own lands at our own hands. Then I mentioned also during this period, you have the Anglo-European monoculture, which is mentioned in the Hadith. The Hadith, which mentions you shall follow the ways of those before you. Al-Yahud wa Nasara, the Jews and the Christians. Today we see the proliferation of a monoculture in the world. That America sometimes does not need to export weapons. They just export McDonald's and uh, various Hollywood movies. And that carries out brainwashing amongst the masses. Hollywood alone has achieved what literature could not achieve. The proliferation of a monoculture. Then, the third stage is referred to as the Duhema. This period involves mindless killing. And then you have the fourth tribulation, which is referred to as Umya, Bukma and Samma, which is deaf, dumb and blind tribulation. This affects the Iman of people. Today, the proliferation of atheism amongst young Muslims, amongst some of the Muslim, uh, amongst former Muslims in the Muslim world. This is a period where the Iman dies due to the tribulation that a person who had Iman, his Iman would die. Why? Because of the weakness of Iman. This is the fourth tribulation within the Ahlas period uh, or the Ghutha period. Within the Ghutha period, this is the fourth tribulation. And then uh, I have some, I sidetrack slightly into the COVID-19. You can read that yourselves. But we move towards general signs. General signs which occur in every time, but they increase in intensity. Today, we have those signs increasing in intensity. For instance, increase of policing. We live in a highly increased policed world. In previous times, there was not such a strong need for so much police. But with capitalism uh, and mega cities, the population needs to be restrained. So you have huge numbers of police officers in major cities. And the police were foretold by Rasulullah how they would beat down people, how they will beat down the public. This is one of the signs that has occurred and continues to occur. Additionally, the devious fatawa, verdicts which misguide people. Examples of those, 
you have some scholars in Saudi Arabia permitting forms of gambling or forms of alcohol or now with concerts happening within the Arabian Peninsula the ulama within Saudi Arabia cannot voice their concerns in fact some of them may give fatwa supporting such practices so these are examples of devious fatwas fatwas that misguide people then alcohol comp consumption and permissibility but what I, I, I also mention is media technology and immorality from the ashratu sa'a is al-fahshu wa tafahushu al-fahsh is immoral acts al-tafahush is extreme immoral acts Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam mentioned ashratu sa'a and mentioned that in the end of times إِذَا ذُكِرَ الرَّجُلُ رُؤِيَ If a man is remembered, he will be seen. Now, when the hadith was stated, people may have not understood what that entails. Today, when we remember someone, we can observe them on our mobile phones. But al-fahshu wa tafahshu entails extreme immorality spreading within the world. That people, that zina, fornication will spread, alcohol, drinking will spread, all these Things are commonplace. Additionally, what is mentioned, musical instruments. Now, to, in yesteryear, musical instruments could have been common that a group of people, a band, played the music on the roads. They played the music in a specific region and location. Today, the music has reached every home through television. And then after television, the music has even reached the masajid. Like when we pray our salah, the music reaches the masjid. This is a part of the spread of the vices, including uh, musical instruments. Then you have towering constructions and shifting mountains. Towering constructions we observe today in Makkah al mukarramah But do you know when they had, in 2009, they had the Jabal Umar radiallahu an construction site which was the shifting of the mountain of Sayyiduna Umar radiallahu an. they actually cut the entire mountain and shifted the entire mountain so the literal shifting of mountains and some of the companions they said when you see the tower construction exceed the height of Jabal Abi Qubais then know that the hour has approached today Jabal Abi Qubais itself has a palace so the construction has occurred, and this sign has occurred in our times. Then, interest-based banking. That today we have usually an interest-based banking across the globe. This is one of the major ashratu sa'a, one of the signs. Major in the sense that it did not occur in previous times, and now it has occurred. Additionally, you have widespread adultery, AIDS, and other viruses. And then the abandonment of jihad, that people will abandon jihad in the way of Allah. Now, in Al Jami'a of Imam Al Tirmidhi, Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa alihi wa sallam stated that jihad stays until the end of time, ila yawm al qiyamah. Jihad will always remain, it will never be cut off until Yawm Al-Qiyamah. Only a misguided fatwa will tell people that jihad has cut off today. There is no jihad. Jihad remains till Yawm Al-Qiyamah. But people abandoning jihad in the way of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is one of ashratu sa'a, one of the signs of the Day of Judgment. That they will abandon jihad in the way of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Then, what is mentioned is a ta'ifatul mansura the supported group. Who is a Ta'ifatul Mansura? Al-Imam Yahya bin Sharaf al-Nawawi rahimahullah ta'ala states it's, it is inclusive of various groups including muhaddithin, scholars, ulama of hadith, fuqaha, jurists, mufassirin, commentators of the Quran who are spread throughout the world. But a Ta'ifatul Mansura is mentioned in four specific places of the globe. In hadith, 
One is in the city of Al Quds Sharif. The sported group is in Al Masjid Al Aqsa, Ala Abwab Al Quds, and the surrounding regions of Al Quds. The second city that is mentioned is Damascus. That a Ta'ifatul Mansura is in Damascus, which exclusively would mean also the 40 Abdal who are in Damascus. And then another city that is mentioned is Antioch in Turkey. And a fourth place that is mentioned is a place known as Taliqan. Where is Taliqan? In modern day Afghanistan. These four cities are mentioned specifically having a Ta'ifatul Mansura. And then after that you have various pockets of a Ta'ifatul Mansura throughout the globe. Then economy and currency. I have a section on economy and currency and this relates to us today. There are so many people that they invest now in virtual currency. And then they make a loss. And if someone popular advises them to invest into virtual currency, they will invest into virtual currency. In reality, Rasulullah advised us to invest in golden land, farming land. So if someone did have, let's say, 50,000 pound, he should buy acres of land with that 50,000 pound where he can support some chickens, some goats, grow something and support himself. Or if he had gold, in the past decade, the gold would have doubled in price. Gold and land. So the economic shift that we observe is also cycles. Every century we have economic shifts. Check some of the years, 1897, 1907, they have different names for the, uh, the crashes. Black Monday, Black Wednesday. Do research, you will find that these crashes happen from time to time. The difficult period that we live in is one of those difficult periods. But what should the believer do? They should invest in farming land, in gold and silver, in those things which do not crash like paper money or the virtual, uh, the virtual currency. So then you have natural disasters. Now natural disasters occur from time to time. You have different shifts of natural disasters that occur. You will have natural disasters occurring in every age. This is one of those signs that has occurred and continues to occur. Additionally, the believer's dream, the dream of the believer. Now there is a hadith that mentions that as time draws near, the, the dream of the believer will be more vivid. Some of the ulama mention that the time drawing near is a reference to winter time. That's why some of us may experience more vivid dreams during winter. Because the day time, in, the daytime is enclosed, draws near, meaning sunrise and sunset. But others have said this is a reference to Akhiru Zaman. In the end of times, the dreams will become more vivid for a believer. Now, dreams are guided by Quran, Sunnah, and Ijma, as I mentioned at the beginning. You cannot take dreams isolated. Otherwise, you will become misguided because a person may eat and consume too much cheddar cheese and they will see vivid dreams. If you don't believe me, try this. When you go home, have a ch cheddar cheese sandwich, eat some cheddar cheese and you will see very vivid dreams. Certain foods cause vivid dreams. Then, what I mention alongside many other signs is the bloating of the crescent. Why do I mention this? Saudi Arabia has had its role in many things. One of those things is bringing out the moon crescent prior to its time. The Ummul Qura calendar is a classic example of how the moon is visible prior to it being visible. So 
when they announce the moon, of course it's permitted for people living uh, in Makkah al mukarrama to do Eid with the announcement of the ruler. This is the position of the Ahl Sunnah because the sin goes on the head of the ruler. As long as he is a Muslim, which he is, we do not do takfir of the Saudis. They are Muslims. If the ruler does announces Eid, the, the citizens follow. But the sin falls on the head of the ruler. But what they do sometimes, and this happens from time to time, they announce the, the Eid prior to the moon even being witnessed, or they claim that the moon has been witnessed. And this, of course, is a controversial issue. But the hadith tells us that min ashrati sa'ati intifaqul ahilla from the signs of the end of times is the bloating of the moon. What will happen? People will observe the moon two days later wa yuqalu lillaylatayn. They will say it's two days old, it's two days old. What does that mean? For instance, today is Sunday. Saudi Arabia says the moon has been seen. The rest of the countries that actually go and observe the moon say the moon cannot be seen and according to correct scientific data it cannot be seen whether we dismiss scientific data or not is a different issue but the next day the moon is seen when the moon is seen some people point at the moon and they say look the moon looks bigger than usual therefore it means that they did see the moon yesterday even though that's not a proof in itself. This is one of the meanings. Another meaning which is determined by the ulama is the, the invention of the telescope. Intifaqul ahilla also entails that the person when he observes through the telescope, the moon will look bloated. They would be able to observe the moon. Then while researching this book, and this was during the inception of Putin's war on Ukraine. I was thinking about space travel. Where in the hadith would we find space travel? And I came across the hadith in Al-Mu'jum Al-Kabir of Al-Imam Al-Tabarani. And also one of the interpretations of one of the Katani Mashaykh where he mentions who is Al-Muntasir Billah Al-Kattani Rahimullah he mentions that this hadith alludes to space travel now there are some Muslims who believe space travel is false they believe it's a NASA conspiracy why they deem it false is for various reasons but I do not tackle those conspiracy theorists in the book it does not make a difference to us whether a man went on the moon or not in fact, there were some mashayikh who disputed it. Like uh, Al-Alama Ghulam Jilani Merti, Rahimullah, he had a written debate with another notable Sunni alim on the given issue. But it's not relevant to us whether it's possible or not. Uh, whether they have done it or not, it doesn't make a difference to our Iman. It's just an invention that takes you out to space. It doesn't affect our faith. Even if they conquer Mars, it's something doable. It's within the parameters of science. It doesn't contradict our faith. But I mention a hadith which alludes to space travel. And then, at this point, I mentioned some other signs. And this is where we reach where we are today. Meaning all these signs, they have happened and they have occurred. Where do we stand now? Today, we observe the war in Ukraine and you have misguided people claiming that Al-Malhamatul Kubra is around the corner. Is this correct? Is Al-Malhamatul Kubra around the corner? The answer is Al-Malhamatul Kubra is a very specific war which occurs after the appearance of Imam al-Mahdi, not before, not before, it happens after. So what is occurring now before that, we see this standoff between Putin 
and NATO. And as the American President Joe Biden said, that a war with NATO would entail World War III. And recently Putin made statements with regard to the use of nuclear arms, claiming that he is not mad enough to utilize nuclear arms. Whether these rulers are psychopaths or not, time will tell. But nuclear warheads and the utilizing of nuclear warheads, and there are some conspiracy theorists, by the way, Muslims also, who believe nuclear weapons do not exist, it's false. So they say what happened in Hiroshima and Nagasaki is all false. The land is like this anyhow. They actually mention this. The land is like that and the Western media gave us a false impression that those lands were attacked through nuclear weapons. When I have met Muslim soldiers, personally I've met Muslim soldiers. Firstly, I've met Muslim soldiers, former British soldiers from modern day Pakistan, at the time they were from uh, colonized India, which is in reality Hind, Mughal Hind. And I would like to alert our Indian Muslims, do not use the secular Indian flag, use the Mughal flag. When you want to identify yourself as a Hindi Muslim, you should find the Mughal flag of Aurangzeb. And Pakistanis and Bengalis should do this also. Find the Islamic flag of Aurangzeb and use the flag of Aurangzeb as your identity. This is essential that you go back to the Hind of Aurangzeb because Aurangzeb was a Sunni Muslim ruler who wrote the constitution of India, which is known as what? Of Hind, which is known as what? Fatawa Alamgiri. Well, Fatawa al Hindiya. So that is your Muslim identity, your Islamic history in Aurangzeb, who is like Nuruddin Zengi was for Syro Palestine. And Hind had the largest e economy in the world at the time, under Aurangzeb. Nevertheless, so. The, those soldiers were stationed in Japan. And I also met soldiers who even met Hitler when they were prisoners in Germany. They met Hitler, he entered their prison camp. They saw him, they didn't meet him, they saw him. But they said, these are eyewitnesses. They were stationed in Japan. One of them lived in Smolith. One of them lived in Smolith in Birmingham. He was stationed in Japan and he said the, the ground was melted. We were stationed and we saw firsthand. Of course, what they must have thought is deploy these Indians into Japan so they can smell all the nuclear fumes. But nevertheless, the man survived until he was well over 80 years old. So there are eyewitnesses who observed these things. Currently speaking, in the next decade, there will only be around 10,000 eyewitnesses to World War II. 10,000 eyewitnesses to World War II. 10,000. That's according to an article in New York Times. If you can rely on the Zionist New York Times. Because someone is saying 3,000. Allah knows best. New York Times is so faulty in its reports that you only need to read Noam Chomsky's scathing criticism of the media in his books. You'll find how biased the, the media actually is. So, where do we stand today? There are a few signs that are yet to happen. Will World War III occur? Firstly, if World War III occurs, if it does occur, it's a war like World War II and World War I. It is not Malhama al-Kubra. It is not Al-Malhamat Al-Kubra, the major Armageddon, if it does occur. But some global geopolitics uh, uh, analysts, they say that sometimes nuclear proliferation is a good thing because it stops other nations from utilizing the actual nuclear warheads. So the more nations that have nuclear weapons, it is a deterrent in itself. This is what they claim. 
but you can never trust this because if you check actual historical reports there have been times when a Russian soldier was commanded during the communist rule to press the button to launch nuclear weapons on the US the soldier refused he didn't carry out the command he saved America he didn't carry out the command it's a fact historical fact and the report, because they were given reports that America has launched its nukes, which was false. So the world is always on a knife's edge. Who can predict? The answer is no one. It's a choice of one or two. Meaning if someone gets it correct, it's because he has the choice between one and two. Will one occur or two occur? The one man says two and the other says one. The one who gets it correct, people will think he has some deep insight with regard to geopolitics. The reality is no one knows. But what do we know from the hadith of Rasulullah from where we stand today? Firstly, we have the Euphrates River, which is diminishing as we speak, even during winter. That it has receded to the point that it cannot recover anytime soon. Partly due to the droughts, sometimes Baghdad, the city of Baghdad, the temperature reaches nearly 50 degrees, central Baghdad, and the, the water levels are diminishing. And partly due to man-made or the, the acts of man through constructing dams like the At Atatürk dams in Turkey, which reduce the levels of water in the Euphrates River. So now, this past year, we have witnessed the levels reducing to the point that people have found ancient tombs, catacombs and ancient treasures, but soon the gold will appear. And when that sign occurs, that is one of the major signs before the appearance of Ali Imam al-Mahdi radiallahu an. So we do not know when that sign will occur. Additionally, you have legalized homosexual marriages amongst Muslims. So legalized homosexual marriages already occur in the non-Muslim majority countries, in some of them, not all. Putin refuses to carry out this abominable act. But countries like Britain and America and other countries, they attempt to pressurize other countries like what occurred now in the World Cup where Qatar was being pressured into recognizing LGBT. So this sign is yet to occur where a Muslim nation recognizes homosexual marriages as being permitted. This sign is yet to occur. What will occur at the tail end of this? The adab of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala which is mentioned. Disfiguration and red winds that will punish people. This sign is yet to occur. Also, a column of fire which, which will appear in the east in the month of Ramadan. This column of fire, some have attempted to interpret this the use of nuclear weapons. So whether the column of fire is caused by nuclear weapons is not clear from the hadith. But what is clear is that Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said when you hear the loud hudda, the loud sound in the month of Ramadan, prepare one month supply of food for your families. <coughs> one month, uh, one year supply. One year supply of food for your families. So when that sign occurs, people must store one year supply of food. What kind of foods? We know storable goods like lentils and other storable goods, water sanitizing machines, these are essential. But we at the same time are not as extreme as the preppers. You have in America the, the preppers, they go to extremes of prepping and they have been prepping since the 1950s and they're still pre prepping. Muslims carry on as usual but when that particular sign occurs, Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam mentioned that you store one year's supply of food when the column of fire appears in the east. 
Then what happens at that particular time is the gathering of the Abdal in Bilad sham And the, emer uh, the Abdal gather in Mecca al mukarramah but also the emergence of a tyrannical ruler known as Sufyani in Bilad sham in Syria. And his emergence is in Damascus. And he carries out acts of disbelief in the Grand Umayyad Masjid. And then from that point, the world will witness the swallowing of an army in an area known as Al Bayda near Al Madinatul Munawwara. And this is the inception, the start of the appearance of Al Imam Al Mahdi. Radiallahu an. So, currently speaking, where we stand is before all these signs occur. What is essential to know? No one knows the time period. So, when will the river Euphrates uncover a mountain of gold? We do not know. When will the column of fire appear in the east? We do not know. But what do we do in that time? The answer can be summarized in three to four ways. Number one, you prepare yourself by increasing your knowledge. Ilm. You must have ilm. Ilm of what? Ilm of Quran. Ilm of the Sunnah. And then ilm of the world that we live in. Three things. We must have knowledge of the Qur'an, knowledge of the Sunnah, and knowledge of the world that we live in. Secondly, we must increase in taqwa, in piety, and iman. How do we do that? By actions. By praying our five daily prayers, by staying firm on our deen, and by, no, by having a third eye with regard to ashratu sa and the tribulations that we observe in the world around us. Thirdly, physical fitness that we must be physically fit this entails having a good diet a natural diet but also exercise how can people expect to survive the end of times and they cannot run around the block how can people expect to survive the end of times they cannot wrestle they cannot uh, do exercise to demonstrate their good health it's essential that we have good diets and good exercise. Fourthly, is taking guidelines in terms of what? Gold, investing in gold and silver. Investing in farmland. So you have a resource of food in times of catastrophe. In, uh, investing in water sanitation machines. Investing in maybe even storage of one year's supply of food in times of catastrophe and disaster. These are the four ways of preparing for end of times and akhiru zaman. Lastly, for more detail, read the book. And you will find more detail with regard to everything that has been mentioned today.